<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. Cops and other law officials, what's the weirdest unexplainable thing that you've encountered? This one time I went out on a call of a suspicious person at a house near where I was at. When I get there the guy tells me that someone knocked on his door and when he went to see who it was there was a woman standing in his driveway with some sort of child-sized doll with horns and it looked like all bloody and cut up. So he asked the woman, who was looking away from him, what she wanted. She turned around and told him it needs food then started screaming at the top of her lungs and ran at him, so like a normal human being he slammed the door in her face and called the cops. I get there and there are well-defined claw marks on his door, there's also a good bit of blood, I suppose from her fingers. So I call it out and start the search on foot, I also had two or three units driving around the area to see if they can't find this chick. So I'm about a block away and we get another call that the woman is back at the guy's house, but in the backyard. So I run about a block back to the guy's house and bust in his backyard. The lights are out so I have my flashlight out and I'm looking around. I see the chick huddled in the corner next to an evil looking doll thing and I ask her if she's okay. She doesn't say anything. About this time one of my mobile units came back to the house and parked his unit where the headlights were shining on her so we could see how scary this chick looked. She had long nappy black hair, her cloths were rags, she had no shoes, clearly homeless, and she kept whispering things to the doll. So my buddy and I approached and tried talking to her and she just kept whispering to the doll, couldn't understand what the hell she was saying so we decided to drag her ass out of there. The second we put hands on this chick she went berserk. Punching, kicking, slapping, all kinds of shit. So we're fighting with her trying to get her on the ground and she's not going down, this chick was strong as hell. Well in the fight she somehow got away from us and was sitting in a crouched position with her head tilted to the side, and making the creepiest growl slash snarling sound I've ever heard. Then she screams at the top of her lungs and charged at us. So, my buddy straight jabbed her in the face and knocked her clean out. We cuffed her and hauled her off to the hospital where she tested positive for PCP and various opiates. She was charged with battery of a peace officer, resisting arrest, and trespassing. Later she was institutionalized for some sort of mental disorder, not sure quite what it was my department didn't have anything more to do with her after her booking into the jail. I had a call to a residence for a mental evaluation or a 5150. Anyways, I get there and speak to a 50-something year old woman, who states her 20-something year old son is under the influence of an unknown drug and kept repeating that he can't go in his bedroom because there was an old man hanging in his room. She stated she was too scared to go in his room and investigate it for herself, because he constantly brings over friends that are drug addicts, and is unsure if his claims were true or not, one former police officer said. I then go speak to the son, who is clearly under the influence of a stimulate. He goes on to tell me that he was told by a spirit to not enter the bedroom, because her father, dressed in his military class A uniform was hanging in his bedroom. I checked the room out and of course there was no body hanging in the room. As I'm in the middle of explaining to the mother that there was no body in the bedroom, a veteran officer arrives on scene to assist me. He pulls me aside and stated earlier in his career he responded to this residence, and that same bedroom, he had to investigate a suicide by hanging of an older male subject. He didn't remember all the details, so I looked it up in our report management system in my patrol car and sure enough the officer was correct. The subject who died was a World War II veteran and had dressed in his military uniform and hung himself. There's a lot of spooky shit that goes down in my neck of the woods, shy town And I mean a lot. Like, more than usual. Like the only reason my entire division, Special Investigations, exists is to deal with it. So I've got some stories. 1. First call that really sticks in my head is from a couple years back, young couple found dead in a hotel room. So we head over. The first thing that hits us is the smell. Blood smells a certain way, a kind of sticky, almost metallic odor, and the air was full of it when the elevator doors opened to the top floor of the hotel. Heading down to what can only be the honeymoon suite the smell gets thicker, almost vomit-inducing by itself. Heading in, this place is ritzy, the sitting room done almost entirely in shades of red and gold. Nice sofas, shag carpet, the works. People have definitely been here, there's clothes thrown about the floor and a half-finished bottle of champagne and a bucket of what used to be ice. No bodies though. So we proceed through toward the bedroom. They must have died sometime the night before, as rigor mortis had already set in. They were on the bed, she was astride him, body leaned back, bowed like a dancer's, the curves of her breasts making a lovely outline. He stretched beneath her, pretty lean, powerful looking dude arms reaching out and grabbing at the sheets. 
If it was a photograph it would have been pretty striking. Except the lovers' rib cages on the upper left side of their torsos had expanded outward through their skin, their ribs jabbing out like snap knives. Blood had sprayed out of their bodies, all the way to the mirror on the ceiling, along with pulped, gelatinous masses of flesh that had to be what remained of their hearts. It definitely cut down on the erotic potential. Called in a specialist to figure that one out, and as often as he explained it to me I never really got a grip on how it was done. 2. Just a few months later we saw a large uptick in wolf killings. Yeah, like people killed by wolves. In inner city Chicago. People ripped to pieces. First thing we think is it's this street gang that has a bit of a wolf motif. That falls through pretty quick. But it turns out there's a connection between all the deaths, all these folks are in some way involved with this thing called the Northwest Passage Project, spearheaded by a guy named McFinn. So we look into it, run by McFinn's place, and this is where it gets weird. Inside there's a girl lying in a pool of blood and her throat is just straight up gone. Like down to her spine, just torn out. We look around a bit and down in the basement is some sort of circle inlaid on the floor. It was a large ring of braided gold surrounded by a bunch of weird writing, all punctuated with gems and inlaid with silver. I mean, I've got my kinks but that shit was just weird. Even weirder, the entire thing looks like someone tried to pry it all out of the ground. We call up that same specialist from earlier and he tells us the circle is meant to keep werewolves in. Seriously. A few more wolf-esque deaths later and we have some people locked up, but every once in a while I stop and wonder whether they really did it. 3. And on top of it all we straight up have a guy who claims to be a wizard who set up shop here. Real weirdo, but he does good work so I'm not going to argue, if you feel like googling him his name is Harry Dresden. I live in a fairly small town, my dad was a cop for 10 years or so, my aunt works in the ER going on 11 years now, and at the time of this story one of my best friend's brother-in-law was an EMT. They are all involved in this sick tale. There was a call about a domestic dispute, then a 911 call from the same address from a woman who was just screaming and then cut off. Of course they sent all available units immediately. After a few officers had showed up, they reported the situation back and the chief decided no female officers or EMTs should be allowed near the scene. It turned out a Hispanic man was on drugs and had a freak out on his girlfriend, accusing her of cheating. He beat the shit out of her, broke several bones. He decided their three-month-old baby wasn't his, picked up the infant by his feet and gutted him with an box cutter. When the cops showed up he was beating on his girlfriend with a kitchen utensil while she huddled over the baby trying to shield him with her own body. They got him subdued, rushed the baby to the ER, tended to the wife in the ambulance out front, and sewed up several cuts of the man in the kitchen. The EMT tending to him was my friend's brother-in-law. The man was still high but coming down and saying a lot of disgusting things about his girlfriend, the EMT slammed his head into the refrigerator, warning him to stop talking. A sergeant was in the room, saw this and gave the EMT an approving nod. A few minutes later, the sergeant got fed up with the man's clearly unapologetic words and said do you hear that woman crying? She trusted you to take care of you, loved you enough to give you a son and look what you've done to them. She didn't cheat, you never let her leave the house so how could she? That little boy is your son, you could have been a father to him and raised him to be a great man, now you've taken that child's life. That woman, who loved you so much is out there weeping because she has just lost her son and her boyfriend, don't you care at all? The man then said that if that baby didn't want him to kill it then it should have died before it was born and that the woman deserved it because she was a dumb bitch, cheating or not, and the sergeant shot the guy in the foot. My father witnessed all of this and later had to testify. My aunt said in the ER the baby was laying there and his intestines were literally laying next to him on the gurney, outside his body. Every single person who worked on that baby requested therapy afterward. The mom had some pretty bad internal bleeding but my aunt said the most disturbing thing was hearing her scream for her baby. She said in all her years in the ER she's never heard anyone scream like that. The mom and the baby actually both lived but the baby has some serious brain damage because he didn't get enough oxygen to the brain because of a punctured lung. The man is in prison, I know he got drug charges, weapons charges, unregistered guns were found in the home as well as more drugs, domestic battery, attempted murder and few others I'm not sure of. I do know he has no possibility of parole and a long sentence but I'm not sure how long the sentence turned out to be. The sergeant and EMT were both fired, that was the hearing my dad had to testify in, among other officers and EMTs. This is by far the best story any of them ever told me. It totally rocked the whole town too. Not my story, but a good friend of mine was the youngest recruit to pass police training etc. in the area for a long time. At 19, he was fresh onto the service. 
I went for a pint with him a week later and you could tell he'd seen things so I asked him what it was like. Within three days he'd been called to a house of an elderly man who hadn't been seen in a few days. They found the man hunched over in the cupboard under the stairs with his hoover in his hand, they reckon he bumped his head whilst about to do some housekeeping and died whilst unconscious. The body had been there a few days and stank, the head had also swollen up. As for unexplainable weird shit, he told me about this one where they were called to a domestic. They got to the house and opened the door, instantly a whole load of sewer rats, not pet rats, flooded out and there was no one home. The lights were on, the TV was on, quiet, and the loud voices they heard arguing were just gone. The only life there were the rats that ran out of the house. They searched the house, every nook and cranny, and found no one. He and his partner for the evening stayed around a while and waited to see if anyone came home, but after a few hours no one came, the neighbors couldn't even explain it. So they left. A few minutes later they got called to the same address again by a different person stating there's a pretty heated domestic going on. This time they brought the dog squad to find people, but again, the house was deserted. He said the freakiest thing was that the toilet had blatantly just been flushed when they got there as the cistern was filling, and the kettle was now boiling. The dogs found nothing as well. To this day he doesn't know what the fuck went on. I worked for a while as a 911 dispatcher, lots of suicides. There are two that stick out in particular. One lady called in screaming and hysterical. Her 15-year-old son had hung himself in the garage. Now, for purposes of the investigation you have to advise the witness to a suicide to not move the body. Every death, in my area, at least, is considered a murder until there is evidence to prove otherwise so messing with the body could confuse the investigation. I had to tell this lady don't cut him down, at which point she told me to go fuck myself, completely warranted in my opinion, cut her son down, and held him, sobbing and screaming, until the police showed up. Another time someone called in a suicide. Gave me the description and location of the victim. The caller seemed really calm, I remember thinking, for having come upon the corpse of a suicide. After I said, okay, the police are on route. Where are you? I suggest, ma'am, you don't stand near the body. No need to see that any more than you already have, she sighed and said, okay, my job here is done. And then I heard a gunshot. I said, ma'am? Ma'am. But she never answered. I advised the police of what I'd heard and for them to be on guard. The lady called in her own suicide. The location was where she was standing and the description she gave me matched the person on the scene whose phone was found a couple of feet away. Get a call about a possible break-in near the downtown area of my city. My partner and I arrive on the scene of an incredibly nice house. I noticed right away that something was strange because the lights in all the upstairs bedrooms were flashing over and over. Partner and I kinda go what to fuck and go and knock on the front door. A woman answers the door and it's clear she has been crying because there is makeup running down her face. I asked her what seemed to be the problem and she was quiet for a few minutes and finally said sir if I told you I'm afraid you wouldn't believe me. I assured her that whatever her concern was we were here to take it very seriously. She said that around two weeks ago she awoke in the night to her bedroom window slamming shut. She said she knew for certain she hadn't left it open and immediately suspected a burglar. The scary thing about it she said was after checking all the rooms and making sure her kids were still sleeping there wasn't any sign of anyone else in the house. She brushed it off and went back to sleep. At about this time as she was telling us the story I heard a loud bang come from an upstairs bedroom. Mom is there anyone else in the house with you? That's the thing she said I'm the only one here. I told her to stay downstairs and my partner and I headed up to the investigate the noise. As we neared the bedroom pictures flew off the wall it was the scariest thing I've seen in my life. My brain repeatedly said fuck this nope the fuck out of here but I knew we had to continue to secure the house for possible intruders. My partner's eyes were as big as seashells when the light bulb above him exploded. We gave each other are you seeing all this look and both nodded. I could see the lights flashing under the door in the room the noise had come from. I slowly open the door and bam lights go out nothing there. Immediately same thing starts happening in the next bedroom over loud banging lights flashing. I run over and slam open the door and same fucking thing nothing. We return downstairs and tell the woman we are concerned and are going to call for another unit to help us get to the bottom of this. I return to the squad car and am calling in the request when I see a figure move past the window of the upstairs bedroom where the banging was. I tell my partner there is somebody up there I just saw them. We ran up the stairs guns drawn and slammed open the door with the classic police get down on your hands and knees. My partner was knocked to the ground from behind and I spun around in time to see him hit the ground. Out of the dark hallway came the figure. I was certain my heart was about to explode when it shrieked I'm a neat about tree fitty. I you know good luck Ness monster. 
You get the hell out of here and quit terrorizing nice ladies you dirty old monster. The monster disappeared with an evil laugh. My partner was hurt pretty badly from the monster shove. He was in the hospital for a couple days with broken ribs. I haven't seen anything quite like that since in all my years as an officer. So I was pretty young at the time, I think about 16. I was actually the one involved in the paranormal shit, not a cop. Anyways, I still hadn't gotten a license, as my boss had me spend all my time at work. It was barely legal. So one night he has me spend the graveyard shift. Crap. I agreed, as I needed the money. I go into my shit hole of a job to my ass out of a coworker. He's an aspiring musician, but he shitted it. It was a dark, rainy night, so we decided to freak each other out with horror stories. After we are both well and scared I have to go take the trash to the dumpster. When I come back I notice that my asshole of a boss installed shitty lights in the building, because they were flickering like all hell. May, oh well, he's always trying to cut corners with the cost of things. Then I notice the walls are a mess, some kind of green goo. Ectoplasm? No, surely not. But this is freaking me out, since I just cleaned the walls. I heard a ring on the phone and picked it up. Hello? No answer. Damn prank calls. That happens a couple more times. You'd think after the second prank call I would stop answering. Anyway, everything is off tonight. None of this stuff had ever happened before. I then see a bus pull up in front of the building. That's odd, the buses never run this late. Something gets out. It was definitely not human. It walks up to our glass doors and scratches it several times. Me and the coworker are shitting bricks. And then we realized. It was the hash slinging slasher. My old roommate's dad was a former naval officer and then FBI agent. 20 years in the Navy and 12 to 15 years or so in the FBI. One of his strangest stories was from his FBI days. I'll paraphrase it below. A kidnapping case, this girl disappeared from her grandparents' RV sometime between like 5 p.m. and midnight. They were up front, next thing they know, she's gone. She was supposed to be sleeping in the back. One stop at a rest stop, then they were in stop and go traffic so they figure she must have popped out the door at some point. This is near the California, Nevada border. So we meet them, talk to them, this is within about a day or so and the girl still missing, no sign of her. She was 15. Local PD theory is she ran off because she's 15 and wants to get away from her lame grandparents for the summer. But there's a busted window, glass inside the vehicle, so we're treating it like a possible kidnapped person. After a few hours, there's a couple different theories on the case. One is that she ran off, another that she got snatched. Nobody's seen the girl in almost two days now, and disappearing in the desert for a young girl is tough. Next thing you know, we get a phone call, naked girl, lost and confused, picked up by some trucker on a two-lane road out there called Nepton. Runs into I-15 between Barstow and Vegas somewhere. Right near the border. Matches our description. Me and three other guys head out there to meet with the sheriff who's got her. Turns out she's our girl. She's fine. No rape. No bruises. No exposure. Nothing. Completely healthy. Completely fine. Even cleaned like she took a shower. Won't tell us a damn thing. Doesn't remember a damn thing. According to her, one minute she's in the RV, the next she's naked walking down the side of the road in 100 degree heat. We talked to her for two hours while her grandparents headed out to pick her up. We had our social services lady talk to her, nothing. I've seen people hiding things, she wasn't hiding anything. She honestly didn't remember. Darndest thing. Anyway, girl was found, she was fine, so we turned it back over to local PD to figure out what happened and determine if charges were pressed and all. I kept in touch with a guy I knew there because I was curious and we were in a fantasy football league. A few months later he tells me the parents sent the girl to a therapist to look for repressed memories to make sure she wasn't raped or something. Therapist says she seems fine, but honestly has no recollection of her time at all, and doesn't think there's any point to delving much further since she has no symptoms and is largely more confused by the reaction than the event. So to this day, We've got a busted RV window with glass on the inside, likely from a moving RV on a jam-packed freeway, likely in broad or lightly fading sunlight, with zero witnesses. A 15-year-old girl gets out, or is taken out, and is taken somewhere safe nearby for almost two days, and then is stripped naked without being touched sexually, cleaned up, and deposited on the side of a separate road a few miles away. She didn't have a drug in her system that we could detect. She remembers nothing at all. Nobody knows what happened to her clothes or anything been almost 20 years since this happened, and I can't figure out what the hell went on with that girl. Still bugs me at night that I have no way to explain it aside from she lied the whole time, 
but I know liars, and I'd bet money she wasn't lying at all. One of my teachers is a retired cop and has a bunch of stories. The most WTF one, was a call he got for a disturbance in a residential neighborhood. It was reported that someone had been throwing around frozen chickens. He arrives on scene and sure enough, there are frozen chickens all over the lawn and surrounding area. Him and his partner check around the area but the chicken thrower is nowhere to be seen. Once they decide they're not going to find the guy, they start heading back to their cruiser when, whiff, flying frozen chicken barely misses his head. He turns around and that's when he sees the suspect. Standing on the porch of one of the houses is a 300-pound woman, but naked, holding two frozen chickens. The woman screams incoherently while throwing the remaining birds and it eventually runs into the house. My teacher enters through the front door, while his partner goes around back to cut off any exits. He makes his way through the house clearing rooms, but the woman has disappeared. Just as he's passing by the bedroom, he gets tackled out of nowhere. The naked, linebacker-sized woman throws him to the bed and he's trapped beneath her rolls. The woman yells, while riding him like a bull. Now my teacher is fearing for his life. Not only is he being crushed by this walrus of a woman, but one of his arms is trapped and she can reach for his firearm at any moment. Just then, his partner enters the room and freezes. He cannot believe what he's seeing. Get her off of me. My teacher screams. Holding back the laugher, his partner grabs the woman and they eventually are able to place her under arrest. My father's story. He was a cop in the 80s and there was a big race riot going down in NJ where we lived after a black kid was accidentally shot by the white man. His unit was outfitted with riot gear, loaded onto a school bus, and taken to the local mall where a crowd had gathered for some reason. They dispersed the crowd and split up into groups to patrol the area and all is going fine. My dad is a decently big guy, rode motorcycles, kicked ass in Vietnam, and was generally not afraid of getting into a fight. So they happen upon an obviously under the influence of something large black dude who starts threatening my pops and the three other cops patrolling with him. Not really wanting to mess with the dude they order him to GTFO and so on. The guy loses it and starts attacking my dad and other cops. Black dude gets one of them in a headlock and my dad not about to let this go any further pulls his baton, aims for the back of the head, and swings as hard as he can. Now this solid wood beating stick breaks over the guy's head and the dude isn't even phased. He releases the headlock and challenges all four cops to a battle royal. My father pulls his magnum, at this point they were allowed to upgrade their service weapons and my dad rolled with a .44, points it at the guy's face and asks if he can stop one of these two. Raging dude realizes gravity of the situation and is promptly cuffed. No it's not that crazy or WTF but I know I couldn't take a police baton to the brain and still stand up afterwards. I used to be a beat cop a long time ago and I'd get called out on domestic disputes all the time, hundreds probably over the years. There was this one guy, this one piece of shit that I will never forget. Gordy. He looked like Bo Svensson, you remember him? Walking tall. Anyway. Big boy. 270-280. But his wife. Whatever she was, she was a lady. Real small. Like a bird. Wrists like little branches. My partner and I get called out there every weekend and one of us would pull her aside and we'd say come on, tonight's the night we press charges. This wasn't one of those deep down he loves me setups, we got a lot of those but not this. This girl was scared. She wasn't gonna cross him no way, no how. Nothing we could do but pass her off to the EMTs, put him in a car, drive him downtown, throw him in a drunk tank. He sleeps it off and the next morning, out he goes back home. One night, my partner's out sick and it's just me. The call comes in and it's the usual crap, broken nose in the shower kind of thing. So I cuff him and put him in the car and away we go. Only that night. We're driving into town and this sideways asshole is in my backseat humming Danny Boy and it just rubbed me wrong. So instead of left, I go right out into nowhere. I kneel him down and put my revolver in his mouth, and I told him this is it. This is how it ends. He's crying, going to the bathroom all over himself, swearing to God he's going to leave her alone, screaming as much as you can with a gun in your mouth. I told him to be quiet, because I needed to think about what I was going to do here. Of course, he goes quiet. Go still. Real quiet. Like a dog, waiting for dinner scraps. We just stood there for a while, me acting like I was thinking things over, Prince Charming kneeling in the dirt with shit in his pants. After a few minutes, I took the gun out of his mouth and I say so help me if you ever touch her again I will such and such and such and such and blah blah blah. Just a warning, of course. Just trying to do the right thing. Two weeks later, he killed her, of course. Caved her head in with the base of a wearing blender. We got there, 
there was so much blood you could taste the metal. The moral of the story is, I chose a half measure, when I should have gone all the way. I'll never make that mistake again. I have dispatched for the police before. There was a mentally deranged person who repeatedly called our office line because there were fairies in her car messing with her engine and brake lines. I did not always dispatch an officer to her but the first time I received a call from her I did. The address she was at turned out to be a vacant home. When the officer arrived on scene he did not find her. As he was calling over the radio to say negative contact unable to find caller. As he was talking I can hear a high-pitched keening sound behind his voice. I thought it might be something up with his microphone so I asked him to check it. I did not hear a response for more than half a minute and did a unit check. Now this was close to 3 o'clock in the morning and we tend to get more antsy when units don't answer radio checks. Another unit who also happened to be in the area jumps on the radio saying he's on route. I keep trying to call him on the radio but still no answer. The second unit gets on scene and doesn't say anything else for another minute. I do a unit check on him and he says units are 10 to 4 but unit 1's radio is in possession of the caller. I've only got 3 units at this point in time, no one else is coming until 5 o'clock. The lieutenant is now coming over the radio saying he's on route. They're out there for 40 fucking minutes never explaining what's actually happening. Then everyone just goes back in service saying no report needed. I later found out that the chick who called in is a crack whore who wears children's clothing and is apparently really good at stealing shit and climbing trees. The officer got the shit scared out of him though because she looks like a skeleton and he barely saw her as she disengaged his radio and then ran the fuck away skittering up a tree. She has family in the area and kept bouncing around their houses. She did eventually get committed. Also, that bitch didn't even have a fucking car. Two stories from a friend of mine that's a cop. 1. Dispatch gets a call from an older couple reporting there's a man standing in their backyard. It's later in the evening and obviously the older couple is freaked out a bit. Several officers show up including my friend and split into two groups heading around either side of the house. As they emerge in the backyard, guns drawn, they see the suspect and promptly order him to get on the fucking ground, face first, hands behind his head. As they draw closer he's not responding and they realize he hasn't moved at all. Rewind two hours, the suspect had robbed a 7 to 11 or something like that down the road and taken off on foot. As he entered the neighborhood he tried to cut through this older couple's backyard. When he went to hop the fence in the back he slipped and impaled himself on a fence post. He couldn't pull himself off it and his own body weight slowly drove him down the post. It had entered at his groin and went straight up to his shoulder. He was literally a human scarecrow. 2. I can't remember if it was neighbors or family members, but someone realized an older gentleman wasn't following his normal routine and became a little worried for him. I think they checked his front door, which was locked, looked in the windows, called the phone, no sign of him. So after three or four days the police are called to check on him. My friend and another office arrive at his house and as they enter the backyard they discover the worst smell they had ever come upon. What had happened was the man took a dip in his hot tub one night and promptly had a heart attack. His body decayed at a much faster rate in the hot water and turned into human soup. My dad's a dog handler in the police and one New Year's Day they got a call saying a guy's phoned and saying he has a koala in a tree in his back garden. We live in Northern Ireland. Koalas are not indigenous. Anyhow, my dad goes along with the dogs, figuring that the man was still drunk slash high from a New Year's Eve party. My dad and his work partner arrived at the place and there was this guy who seemed totally sober and normal who led them to the back garden, where there was a big tree in which, sure enough, there's a creature sitting. Somehow they managed to get it in on of the dog cages from the police van, they're kitted out for about four dogs, and there were only two there at the time, so there were spare cages. Turns out it was actually a red panda who had escaped from the zoo and was just chilling around different gardens in the suburbs. Probably not the weirdest thing he's seen but definitely the most unexpected. He also had to go out on a search through a forest by a big river in the dark after a guy who may or may not have been in possession of a machete. He said that was one of the scariest things that he had to do, because he had no idea whether he was about to get his head hacked off every time he passed a tree. The guy had already cut his friend's arm off then run away, so he was definitely capable of it. Turns out that he had ditched the machete in a field and then gone into a shop in the city covered in blood, and they called it in. My old man was a cop for 35 years. Over the years, I've heard a lot of funny stories. Not many WTF stories but I think he preferred to keep it light and fun. A guy was threatening to jump off a tall apartment complex. My father was on the ground, blocking off traffic. Eventually, the guy jumped to his death. Commotion ensued and someone asked over the radio what happened. 
My father response was he jumped. And what really sucks is the Russian judge only gave him a 9.5. A lot of people with scanners reported him. Result, verbal tongue lashing. A woman pulled over to the side of the road, where he was working a detail. She asked him how she can get to Harvard. His response, study real hard. He then laughed at his own joke, the norm, and walked away. She reported him. Result, chief told him to cut the shit. He got called to a report of two thieves stealing oriental rugs from a condo complex. He spotted two dudes running with the rug rolled up and on each of their shoulders. I guess they ended up in a wooded area and he was out of breath. He yelled, please just fucking stop. I'm going to have a heart attack. The two guys stopped and quickly turned around towards him. He reached for his weapon and, wouldn't you know, it wasn't there. He came up with a handful of air. The two guys laughed and just ran off with no pursuit from the Keystone cop. Result, spent four hours searching the woods for his gun. Finally found it suspended on a branch. This was before the days of safety holsters. My dad told me this story a few months back. He belongs to a police-based motorcycle club, their president was asking everyone if they had photos of the trips they had taken to put on their website, everyone was coming up with a blank. Fast forward a few weeks later, my dad's having a shitty day at work reorganizing a room filled with boxes of documents with a few other guys. The stress got to him so he decided to take his lunch break and head to the cemetery and visit his friend Steve's gravesite. Steve committed suicide about six years back, really missed the guy, spent a lot of time at his house, he was like family to me. Anyway so my dad's there just talking out his problems, tell Steve we miss him, etc. He heads back to work feeling better. His co-workers already finished organizing the room while he was gone, one of them approaches him and says hey, I know he was your boy, thought you'd want to look at this. He hands my dad a box with Steve's name on it. My dad's a bit confused as he thought he'd given all of Steve's possessions back to his family. He opens the box and it's about half full of reports, he notices a stack of CDRS in there as well. He pops them in a computer and they were filled with pictures from their motorcycle trips, a few years worth. He, and I too, I guess, likes to think Steve left those for him, doing him a little favor. That's just the kind of guy he was. Music